Good morning. I'd like to welcome you very cordially to our quarterly conference. We're going to talk about our results, our financial performance, about what surrounds us. Today, we have a hybrid meeting. We have participants sitting here in the head office at Kaspshaka Street, and some of you are joining us remotely. So once again, I'd like to welcome everybody very cordially. The agenda is just as you see it here on the screen. We'll talk about what the bank has achieved in the Q1, what the macroeconomic environment looks like. We'll talk about, we'll respond to your questions if in fact you're going to have any questions. The most important information, ladies and gentlemen, Q1 was not a typical quarter. So had life gone along a normal path, there wouldn't have been the outbreak of war. And so the entire organization was organized in order to help our uh, employees, families, and the refugees from our sister bank, Ukraine Bank. And so I want to drill down into the details. We talked about that during the annual conference. And so many of us were volunteers, were helping out to provide this aid, and there was a lot of real commitment. And so I'm grateful to the overall uh, BNP Paribas group, which gave substantial financial support for our activities. And that means our refugees were able to feel just at home, if one can say that. And so despite the outbreak of war in Q1, we announced our strategy for the from for the period from 2022 to 2025 this is the go beyond strategy and so this is an important moment in the in the history of the bank we finished wrapped up the fast forward strategy we've begun the execution of the new strategy q1 is the first quarter during which a portion of our organization has been operating under agile at scale and so we have a large number of employees and multiple uh, tribes. And so we had to work out new approaches uh, to follow as a result of the war. And we had to put in place various solutions. And so it's very important for us to be agile. And this is much more the case as opposed to under a project approach. We are a business. And this is not something that we should forget. And so we have positive commercial trends in terms of volume. We have major growth in terms of attracting new customers. This is also something that's quite positive. If we look at our deposits, we've seen growth here. So basically, the bank has expanded, has grown in Q1 quite clearly. As a result, we have robust financial results. And we can start with the net uh, profit 278 million so this is an increase of 69 percent year on year this is a major growth and this is a high result uh, of course it continues to be burdened by some of the provisions linked to the mortgage loans and portfolio denominated in uh, swiss francs as I said, we have positive volume trends in, on the lending side. This is important to us. As I can go back several quarters, we were trying to catch the wind in our sales. And this was a challenge. And now we can say that with respect to the peer group, we actually have demonstrated quite solid results. So we have uh, growth uh, in the double figures. Uh, quarter on quarter, year on year. And so we'll talk about that in just a moment. And we'll talk about that in detail. As I mentioned, the strategy is now in the execution phase. We have four pillars. Uh, so together, this is about people doing this together. So this is a pillar about our human resources. And you have examples here of some of the numbers that uh, reflect the execution of the strategy and some of the implementations that we've been able to confirm I mentioned that we have a large number of employees who are very heavily involved and engaged in the voluntary work for our customers 
And this shows that the organization is strongly rooted in values and we will not remain indifferent uh, to a crisis, a refugee crisis following the war. We have new implementation of technology. I was smiling because we were rolling out uh, bleak on the phone. We're not the first bank to do this, but we do have it. We've uh, distributed a small clip, a short clip that's quite uh, humorous in the social media. And we're very pleased to have bleak by phone and our, our customers were waiting for that. And so as a bank that has grown as a result of a number of mergers and acquisitions and in a few places, we had to catch up to the rest of the market. And this is actually happening. We have the chat bot, uh, which is something that uh, fields questions, inquiries from customers. We're working a lot on cybersecurity uh, prior to the outbreak of the wall, war. Uh, banks were put in a stage of um, heightened vigilance because we were afraid that we could become uh, victims of cyber attacks linked to Russia. We can knock on unpainted wood and we can say that nothing bad has encountered us, but certainly we're more vigilant and we're ready. We're better. Um, we have greater safeguards if we look at the development and uh, growth. So this is the up pillar. We can say that we're the first bank that offers a 10 year fixed interest rate mortgage loan. Up until now, the market has been offering financing for five fixed fixed uh, term fixed interest rate for five years. We also offered that, but now we have for a 10 year periods and we can see that customers are starting to prefer uh, and we can see that uh, customers prefer the five year period for fixed uh, interest rates. We also have uh, product lines for innovative co companies. We understand this risk. It's different from mature companies. But we believe that this is a very interesting segment with major growth potential, and we would like to support this segment. And if we look at the positive pillar, this is sustainable development is at the very focal point of our attention. We've seen volumes of financing we've granted to having grown very strongly. And we can see that in our structures, we have sustainable sustainability linked loans. This is something that will continue. Naturally, we're pleased to receive some awards here, but this is not a surprise. And so I've mentioned our engagement, our commitment to helping people in Ukraine because of the war. And I said that I wouldn't drill down into the details, but you can see on the slide here, we've been given support by the group. And I'm very pleased to be a member of a group where this group has not been indifferent uh, to this war. And and we have employees from Uk Bank and we've provided support to them. And so in Warsaw, we have a command center for Uk Bank. And so we have tens of employees from there and they're providing the support services and we're providing support to them there. And we were very quick and flexible in terms of helping refugees in terms of bank accounts. So you can see that we've set up more than 45.2 thousand personal accounts and some 30,000 almost in March alone. And soon we'll probably have 300,000 in total and we can say that this is a skill we have, a, a language skill. It's a sophisticated linguistic, linguistic skill and will help our customers from uh, Ukraine during their sojourn, during their period of living in Poland. So if we look at some of the digital statistics, everything's going up. So that means it's following the right directions, going in the right direction. So we're very pleased. So in some areas, we can say the rate of growth is faster. In other areas, it's a little bit slower. Certainly, the market has taken, has onboarded our solutions like GoMyobile uh, Internet. 
And so basically our transformation will continue. We're all utterly convinced that the development of remote channels and automation and digitalization of internal processes, these are the proper uh, growth directions and they're firmly rooted in our uh, go beyond strategy, the new strategy. And so now if we take a look at our activity, our commercial or business activity, our sales activity, regardless of which term we'd like to use to term this, to describe this, you can see that in most of the quarters, uh, Q, in most of the categories, the first quarter was a growth category. If we look at personal accounts, we've been able to ramp up the pace of acquiring new customers. So we have uh, cash loans to a lesser extent. This is true of mortgage loans. One area that's under pressure, those are investment products and asset management. And so the interest rate increase, in interest rate hike, means that some of the customers are choosing more traditional forms of investing their surpluses. At the beginning of the war, a large portion of the funds uh, was paid out in cash as people were fearful. Uh, of uncertainty, I think. And so not all of that money came back to the sector. And this is money that I think will come back to the sector as deposits uh, will be more attractively priced. And here you can see some major transactions with big corporate customers. I think it's worth mentioning the loan for Virtual Napolska, which is a sustainable linked sustainability a sustainable linked loan and so we believe in subsequent quarters we'll have more such uh, loans so if we look take a look at the volumes we can see higher market shares in terms of loans and deposits and we can say this was very market growth especially on a year-on-year -year basis and we're very pleased by the loan activity volume increase, and this shows our development. But the deposit side of things is also very important, and so I would anticipate that in this area we will continue to grow, especially if we look at retail customers. The number of customers has grown in the quarter. It's grown year on year above 4 million in a very clearly clear basis. And so this is something that also pleases us. So now if I take a look at specific results, you can see net banking income is on the rise. It's very clear growth. You can see the provisions for Swiss franc loans. And we can say that it was a little bit higher than in Q1 of last year. But we can say that this is not a substantial amount compared to the previous year. And so we can say that we had to add some, we had to pad the provisions, and that's something that will continue to accompany us for some time. We believe that costs are under control, even though costs have grown. We know that we are facing inflationary pressure. We're also facing expectations of pay raises, and so We've done a traditional round in March. We always do this in the first quarter where we give raises and give bonuses. And so we'll flexibly react to the labor market situation. We know what's happening. It's a demanding situation. And for some time, it will continue to be uh, such in such. It will continue to have those attributes. We also have the Polish deal where some employees have lost uh, in, net amounts of their salaries and and in some cases we don't have enough qualified people in terms of the needs of the overall market if you look at the net profit as i said it was 278 million zwadis you can see on the white bars what the net profit would have been had it not been for the swiss franc provision and so this is a theoretical uh, value so let's stick to what we've actually reported the 278 
and you can see that it's much higher than we saw one quarter ago, one, one year ago in first quarter. And so we can see that we have a slight decline in costs. Costs of risk is under control. And I think that's about it. If you look at our net interest margin is going up. And this is not surprising, having in mind the interest rate hikes. And then we have ROE at 10%. On one hand, that's something that appears to be positive. On the other end, we'll see what the upcoming quarters will accrue us because we're in a situation where there's a lot of volatility uh, unpredictability for a large number of reasons and we'll probably talk about those reasons today so let's go on now to the macroeconomic issues so thank you very much welcome i'll start with the positive information it seems that the high rate of economic growth around 8%. This is something that we saw being continued in April, or at least it didn't subside very much. But having in mind the increase in the prices of commodities, materials and components, raw materials, and softer market conditions around the world and greater uncertainty linked to the war in Ukraine, well, the subsequent quarters, subsequent months will probably be softer. So the pace of growth will probably grow a little more soft, become softer. One of the things that's not good or disquieting in the current situation is that this slowdown will be accompanied by inflation that's high and perhaps even inflation whose pace will be picking up and this will lead to erosion of the real income income in real terms you know disposable income that households have and it might deteriorate the overall allocation of capital across the economy so the inflation we're grappling with right now will be with us for at least more than well, 12 months, 14, 15, some odd months. And so this will have an impact on the banking sector and the financial markets. And having in mind this high inflation, double digit inflation that continues to pick up the pace, that's why we have interest rates uh, moving upward. So the May hike is not the last one. And so the governor of the National Bank of Poland spoke quite clearly, as did other members of the Monetary Policy Board, that we should anticipate a continuation of the upward swing, so the tightening of monetary policy. So higher interest rates will affect the household loan segment and the softening demand for loans is something one could observe at the end of last year or the first quarter of this year and so it's certainly the case that this is something that will continue it won't be a especially high amount of demand for loans amongst the household segment but in subsequent months what we will see continuing we'll see corporate loans growing especially amongst the large corporates or the demand for working capital loans because the the cycle in which we find ourselves sees increasing inventories and these inventories have to be financed at least for the next several months. So this is something that will continue to transpire over the next several months. And this is where I'd like to wrap up my uh, discussion at this time. Thank you. Everybody, as already stated by Pshamek, the financial results of the first quarter 2022 were solid. Uh, credit grew by 15.3% uh, year to year. Deposit grew by 13.2%. Net result grew by 69% year to year, reaching the level of 270 
8 million slotty. NBA uh, grew by 27.5% year to year, mainly boosted by the good performance in terms of net earnings income, under the impact of the growth in the loan portfolio and also the increase in the interest rate. Another good quarter in terms of fees and commission, which uh, grew by 21.6% year to year. Costs were under control, but we have to keep in mind that costs were affected by the normalization of BF, uh, BFG, so costs grew by 16.5% year to year, excluding the impact of BFG normalization, so costs grew by 11% year to year. Cost income ratio reached the level of 52.8%, decreased by 5 uh, basic points year to year. We have slightly adjusted our level of provisioning in terms of mortgage loan portfolio, and we book additional provision in the amount of 83 million slotty. And cost of risk is fully under control, uh, reaching the level of 79 million slotty in the first quarter. As regards the loan portfolio, which grew by 15.3% year to year. The growth reached a level of 3.5% quarter to quarter. The main driver in terms of loans growth is the corporate loans portfolio, which grew by six, uh, uh, which grew by 4.8% quarter to quarter. We have good performance. Um, uh, individual loans portfolio grew by 13.9% year to year. Uh, lower dynamic compared to the corporate loan portfolio in Q1, plus 1.7%. As regard the FX mortgage loan portfolio, we slightly adjust the parameters of the provision and we book 83 million additional provisioning. And we are keeping on negotiating with our customers. So what we have to, to remind you that out of 3,000 customers we have contacted, since the beginning of the negotiation, already 625 customers uh, accepted the offer. The deposit grew by 13.2% year to year, plus 5.9% quarter to quarter. Very good dynamic uh, in terms of corporate deposit, which grew by 23.2% year to year and 11% quarter to quarter. Lower dynamic. Uh, uh, regarding uh, the customer's deposit, which grew by 1.6% year to year, and a slight decrease quarter to quarter, 0.4%. Investment product had been uh, impacted by the interest rate hike. Uh, as a result, uh, in, in pro investment product decreased by 23.6% year to year and 24.4% quarter to quarter uh, due to the performance of the debt fund. Net banking income grew by 27.5% year to year under the impact of the interest rate increase, uh, growth uh, in loan portfolio, and good uh, level of activity with our customers. Quarter to quarter, plus 13.6%. Uh, 13 As regards the net interest income, uh, year to year, an improvement in the margin. So the margin grew from 2.46% to 3.02%. Quarter to quarter, uh, net interest income increased by 16.1%, resulting from the growth in the loan portfolio and the interest rate increase. However, uh, lower uh, NII uh, as regard the uh, aging um, product by 72 million slotty. Another good quarter in terms of fees and commission. So year to year, uh, fees and commission increased by 21.6%. Quarter to quarter, I would say uh, a stable level. So uh, reaching the level of 301 million slotty, uh, boosted by a good performance in terms of cards due to the settlement with MasterCard, Euronet, and Visa and also good level in terms of asset under management and the sale of structured product. Net trading income slight decrease year to year, minus 4.6%. Quarter to quarter, uh, increased by 7.7%, resulting from the good level of business with our customers and a lower negative valuation in terms of IRS. 
as regards the net investment income, uh, um, compared to the previous quarter, uh, I will say in uh, the first quarter we didn't sell uh, um, uh, securities, and you have to keep in mind that in Q4 we sold securities which result in the losses. Operating expenses grew by 16.5% year to year under the impact of the BFG normalization, increase in the salary, uh, higher costs in terms of borrower support funds and additional costs in terms of consulting, so which result in such increase. Uh, quarter to quarter, uh, increased by 9.9% if we are excluding BFG normalization, so slight decrease by 10%. Now I'm giving the floor to Wojtek about the cost of risk. Um, so if we take a look at the loan portfolio behavior uh, in Q1 in 2022, the costs and risk are very stable. So the cost of risk is 36 basis points, 79 millions, what is that was a result of uh, two factors occurring at the same time. So the bank posted provisions as a result of, uh, uh, well, there was an amount of 117 millions, what is because of deteriorating marking conditions. We also had uh, 65 million in provisions released from 2021 and that reversal took place as a result of the cancellation of uh, change in the law where uh, the recoveries expected on loan portfolios for farmers. So if we take into consideration these two figures on a net basis, this is a figure of 52 million versus the overall cost of risk of 79 million. So we can say the normalized cost is below, below 30 million. Of course, we continue to maintain provisions in set up in previous years for COVID. This is some 200 million. We haven't made any reversals, nor have we uh, set up any additional provisions. And we believe that in the current circumstances, this is an area where we should have some potential reversals in the future. If we look at the exposure or the um, exposure to small companies, micro companies, retail companies, and the bank's exposure as a result of their uh, activities in Ukraine, Belarus, uh, or Russia was very limited. And so in Q1 of this year, it wasn't necessary for us to set up any additional provisions. So we believe that this, we won't go to zero, of course, with the percentage of loans which have impairments, but it does seem to us that the level is very safe at 3.4%. We believe that this is improving in each one of the segments, and this is a result of several facts. So the portfolio, the regular performing loans is continuing to work. We're also making recovers. We're down to 3.1 billion. This is the lowest level, nominally speaking, in terms of NPLs in the bank. And we continue to see very small new um, amounts coming into restructuring. So we can say that at this point in time, the situation is correct, it's proper, and it's been stable for a longer period of time. And so if we think about coverage, there's no major changes. So if we look at stage one, this is proper as long as the portfolio is growing and stage one is growing, then stage three is diminishing. Stage two is being maintained. This means we're in a safe situation. And of course, in Q2, this might fall a little bit, the coverage, because we'll sell a portion of the non-performing portfolio, and it's usually got a very high level of provisionings. And so there shouldn't be any additional um, impairments. 
because the level of provisioning is against the price it basically is that we usually have a positive impact for the bank so thank you very much capital ratio decreed uh, in the first quarter uh, due to two factors the, the first one resulting from the increase in our loan book so additional rwa and in parallel, uh, decrease in our equity due to the negative valuation of our bond portfolio. However, capital ratio are still above the minimum requirement. So we're now gradually coming close to wrapping up the presentation and then we can move on to the Q&A session. This slide reminds us of some of the key parameters, the KPIs, when we talk about our strategy, some of the parameters that we'd like to, these are parameters or the figures that we'd like to achieve, the target figures at the end of 2025. I won't dig down into this. I can say that we live in exceptional times, uh, times that are very unpredictable, difficult. They represent a, a burden a mental burden. It's very difficult to foresee the future, both geopolitically and macroeconomically. I have no doubts whatsoever that that there are darker clouds coming close to the Polish economy, and we have inflation of 12.3 percent, probably 15 percent, had it not been for the shield. We have interest rates rising. And that means there's going to be less demand for loans, primarily amongst retail customers. There may be some challenges uh, amongst customers in terms of debt service in all segments, in various, various segments. We don't see it yet, but we don't know what's going to happen. And we don't know how and when the war in Ukraine will come to an end. We're hearing more and more about ideas uh, projects and proposals uh, from the government of providing aid to borrowers. And one of the things that is disquieting and should disquiet us and concern us is that the bulk of these costs should be covered by the banking sector. In a country where we have a, a market economy or a country that would like to have a, an economy of that sort, these are not signals that uh, fill one with special optimism, uh, nor does this narration, which continues to perpetuate, that if there's a problem, then we should take money away from banks and help other social groups or other groups. So I think the banking sector in uncertain times should be healthy, stable. It should be capable of generating debt, money, and should be capable of feeding the economy and generate uh, profits that will build uh, the equity base. It should not be a source of uh, short-term assistance for various stakeholders. I won't maybe get into this polemic in terms of whether or not customers should take responsibility for their decisions or not for their decisions, or if that responsibility ultimately should somehow be shifted to other uh, market players. I'm sure that you are aware of my opinion in this matter. And so we have to be prepared mentally and financially and operationally for a variety of uh, surprises and switches. And so next quarters and years are, are becoming more and more difficult. Nevertheless, I am convinced that the bank is well poised and it's capable of operating in demanding times, volatile times. We showed that during the uh, COVID-19 period, we showed that we are a technologically sophisticated bank and we're also capable of dealing with cyber attacks. So there's no reason for us to think that we wouldn't be able to deal with these more difficult times. Nevertheless, we do see those darker clouds appearing on the horizon with respect to the entire economy. 
And that would be it in terms of the presentation. I don't think traditionally we're not going to talk about the activities of the various business uh, divisions. This is available in the materials. So I think we should go ahead and look at the responses, uh, the questions and answers session. Hello. I would like to ask you for a broader comment about the preliminary government proposals in terms of providing aid to borrowers. What would that mean for the sector? What would that mean to have a bigger borrower uh, support fund and credit vacations? And what do you think about VBOR? Can you imagine some other benchmark that would be more just, uh, that would be able to replace a VBOR? So I'm going to avoid making any precise reactions to these proposals because these proposals aren't precise. They're more slogans. And the Prime Minister has said something about the subject two weeks and one day ago at the Congress in Katowice. And since these are general or vague statements and haven't been stated precisely, it would be very difficult to say precisely what the impact, impact would be. I can say that this can only be a negative impact uh, for this sector. So adding money to the borrower support fund, my opinion is this fund has some 600 million swatis, practically speaking, from the moment when that fund was set up, it has not been used or used only to a marginal degree. So adding additional money there to that fund until that money is used, that would seem to be unnecessary, not to say improper. And perhaps there are other forms, you know, you could loan money to that fund and not necessarily make additional contributions to that fund to make sure that the costs would not be borne solely by banks. If we think about loan vacations, credit vacations, I understand that idea. There's a lot of sense. But nevertheless, my opinion is that we shouldn't have an automatic mechanism, regardless of the situation, regardless of somebody's ability uh, to service debts on a timely basis, then everybody could utilize these vacations, credit vacations. That's not how the world should work. And so I'm very much in favor of the bank being showing empathy and looking at the situation, scrutinizing the situation of every single customer. But I do not believe, however, that general availability of vacations amongst people who are capable of servicing their debts with no problem whatsoever, or f having in mind those people who have taken out multiple loans to buy apartments for investment purposes. It doesn't seem to me that a solution of this sort would be needed by the market. Of course, more precision has to be provided here. The question is, if you use this vacation as a customer, will we have to reclassify the credit ex or loan exposure and will we have to set up a provision? And today, there is no response to that question because we don't know the specific uh, nature of these loan vacations, what that would mean legally. And then finally, the question about VBOR. I'll look at Michal and I'll ask him to give a comment about what could, in fact, replace the VBOR benchmark. But let me say the following. This is not the problem. It's a VBOR or something else. The problem is that the interest rates are much higher than they were. So, so changing VBOR could maybe release some of the emotions. And perhaps this would reduce the income of the financial sector. But that's not the essence of the matter. Well, what else could I add? The replacement of VBOR with some other benchmark is not controversial. We've been preparing for this to happen for several years. It's part of the general European trend. But the question is, what is the new benchmark to be? Well, based on what type of transactions what type of tra transactions will be used to determine that benchmark and who will be responsible, who will be the administrator of this new benchmark rate? Because we've also heard about an option, uh, a backup option, that the new benchmark 
would be Polonia. But generally speaking, the rule is that every interest rate based on overnight rates after it's cleaned up a bit or smoothed, it'll be closer to the official prime rate of the central bank or a six, than a six-month VBOR rate, which today is also discounting future um, increases or hikes in interest rates. So it's discounting them to some extent, whether we talk about the governor of the National Bank of Poland or other members of the Monetary Policy, Monetary Policy Board, which have talked about that. So I think we can go on to the online questions, and I'll go ahead and read these questions, and then we'll respond to these questions. Collectively, we have several questions from Marcin Chaplitsky. Is the bank worried by the Tier 1 decline to 1 percent? Do you want to take some efforts or actions as a result of that? And what are your expectations in terms of the further growth of lending activity? What are your what? How do you see your growth against the market? You want to grow faster than the market, or at the same or slower? And which segments? And what about the fixed mortgage loans? How do you differ from other products where you have this 10-year period? So does the bank have the, the, the intention to increase and in, increase the deposit rates? And do you see a moment in time where the growth in these interest rates would uh, be, be stopped? And thank you very much for your responses in advance. And so I'll ask uh, Jean-Charles maybe to begin. I'm going to start um, with the capital ratio. So capital ratio are under pressure mainly due to the de de deterioration of the bonds portfolio valuation. So it has a significant impact. As, as we expect further increase in the interest rate, we can expect further decrease in the valuation of the bond portfolio. However, I would be very balanced. So we are not expecting that um, the impact on the capital ratio will be higher than 2.01%. Okay, I, I understand that. These figures have been selected because below such level, we will breach the minimum capital requirement. So no, it's not at all the situation. We have also to keep in mind that in the coming months, we are going to recognize the net result of 2021, and we are going to recognize the results of the first half of the year, okay, later in the year. And also, we can expect a decrease in the growth in loan portfolio which will have an impact. So to summarize, we expect further deterioration in the coming months, but we are taking also some initiative to avoid any bad news. So we'll be uh, careful in terms of capital allocation, in terms of growth, and uh, additional initiatives are all already launched to compensate the negative impact of the valuation of the bond portfolio. So tell us all expensive. Now a few words about the expansion of lending later in the year. We know it's a difficult situation. We believe that demand for loans amongst retail customers will fall. So it'll be lower, we'll have lower credit worthiness, especially if we look at mortgage loans. So I would anticipate that the rate of growth will fall off and then in CIB customers or SME customers and corporates will probably borrow more in terms of working capital loans. So we do see room to grow, to develop, and we have a lot of aspirations. Will be, this be faster than the market? Well, we'd like to grow faster than the market. What happens, we'll see. If we look at the sales of fixed interest rate loans, this is growing gradually. 44% of our loans were sold with at fixed um, rates. So the tenor that's dominant is five years, even though the cost for a 10-year uh, loan is, necessary, is basically the same. So customers continue to think in such a way 
that if I take a loan for a longer period of time and the interest rates could fall and that I'll be stuck with a higher interest rate. This is actually something that's more speculative, but this is a step in the right direction that more and more loans are being extended with a fixed interest rate. So will you improve your allocation? Of course, we're going to react with respect to the market interest rates and the expectations of customers and also to have in mind our own liquidity needs. So generally speaking, we will react flexibly. So these products, we didn't talk about stopping them, where the interest rates will, well, it depends on what's going to happen with the market interest rates. So we can have and espouse various theories in terms of where the Monetary Policy Board will say stop. So we can ask any number of analysts and economists and we'll get that same number of responses as the number of people we ask in terms of what the inflation rate is going to be, what's going to happen in the economy, and then you would either you know slow things down or stop them, cap them. I think that's about it in terms of the questions that were posed by Marcin Chaplitsky. Here we have a question from Jacek Ramontowski about provisions for possible deterioration in this scenario. I think we talked about that during the presentation itself. The same is in terms of what you'll use to replace the VBOR benchmark. Then we have Business Center Poland. How do you think about the increase in deposit rates in, in order to satisfy the government uh, preferences? And what about you know, the various incentives to raise those deposit rates. So once again, we have a topical area that's very difficult for me. I'm an economist by, and I'm a liberal in terms of my convictions. I was raised as an economist. And so I don't remember communist times with nostalgia. I want the market to determine we have a very competitive banking sector. And I'm convinced that the competitiveness um, common sense mean that at the proper time, uh, interest of deposits will grow to a rational level and government intervention in terms of, you know, the government asking people to raise deposit rates or enacting laws. This smells like centrally planned economy. We've had that and that didn't come to a good end. Uh, to an outcome. And so I certainly wouldn't want the government to steer prices, control prices in a competitive industry. I wouldn't want this to happen or have to happen. And I'm personally convinced that in banks will raise deposit rates as they want to have stable liquidity amongst their retail customer base and the government intervention will not be needed. And that's about it, I think, on that subject. Here we have a question from Wukash Janczak. So if we look at the end of law, at the end of Q1, is it possible that you will have to, uh, will you be released from the dis from the split of, uh, of profits for 2021? If we look at the FX loans dropping below the 5% threshold, that's at the consolidated level, at the level of the bank itself. As, a, enter, as an entity, it's around 5%, and it's certainly going to fall if we look at the percentage of FX loans. But in uncertain times, in, if we look at the reactions of the KNF, it's very difficult to make a statement about what could be done with the distribution of profits. What will be the level of the capital ratios if we look at 100% loss on bonds at the end of Q1 2022? It's a difficult question, so I'll give it to Jean-Charles. In terms of TRN ratio and both 15 in terms of TCR. Santander, having in mind the competences of Ben Pariba, if we look at ag and food, what is the likelihood of famine in the world? I personally don't feel that I have such a high level of expertise, expert knowledge. I've asked our experts what they think about this reality about famine across the world. Ukraine 
and Russia are major exporters of ag products, primarily meal, cereals, and so grains. There's going to be a problem here. And so perhaps a change in nutritional habits. This might seem paradoxical if you eat more meat then you eat less uh, grain well actually the less meat we eat the less uh, grains i've heard this theory i'm laughing a little bit because it sounds i don't eat meat almost at all i don't see myself as a carnivore exclusively but our experts haven't indicated that in the short term that we have this phantom or this risk of a famine. But if we don't come to terms with everything in terms of climate change, there is there are risks. If we look at CO2 emissions, if we look at the generation of electricity, we know for a number of other uh, sources, there is a risk of the end of the world if we're not going to take active efforts. We're going to have you know an end of the world event coming up, and that would be it full stop. So if you look, the interest rate income is growing slower than the market, and then the hedging on fixed rates will actually lower your sensitivity. Well, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask for your uh, vigilance and to correct me if I'm incorrect. There are several reasons of this. One, we have a policy of investing in securities that are focused on stabilizing our income results. So we are conservative investors. To a large extent, we're trying to hedge our interest rate risk. And that means when interest rates fall, then we're more resistant to that consequence. And if the interest rates grow, then we don't have a benefit to the same extent as our competitors. That's the strategy we've embraced. And this is one of the major factors, is that the structure of our portfolio is such. And then the level of hedges against interest rate risk. And so the value of a portfolio is relatively large. We have bonds from PFR and PGK, which we have subscribed for during the pandemic. And we want to support the Polish economy. And these are fixed rate bonds. I haven't used that term in the past, but I'll say they have a fixed interest rate, a fixed yield, and that's one element. The second element is that our loans for personal finance, those are fixed interest rate loans. And we've been following that policy for many years. When we lend money to customers, we have a fixed rate. That means we're not catching benefits from an increase in interest rates from the existing portfolio. I think that's about it. Did I? <laughs> then we have banks are informing about higher employee salaries for their employees. What's going to happen with uh, BNP Paribas? Well, every year we did a round of raises. We do this once a year. We do this in March. And so in real terms and as a percentage of the salary fund, it was more it was more than double what it was usually the case. And so it's my impression that most of our employees have accepted the raises we offer it with satisfaction. Of course, we'll remain um, flexible in terms of reacting to pay proposals, perhaps in the course of the year to somehow, you know, somehow violating that rule that we followed for many years. But if necessary, but banking uh, is a matter of the people and we're going to care for our people, both in terms of the flexible model of work, their pay, their compensation, the career growth, uh, career planning and, you know, their training, all of those other things, both here in Poland and across the world. What was the average increase uh, in wages in March? I'm not sure if we disclosed that type of information. I don't think we've done that up until now, so I'm not going to respond to this question in a specific manner. I think we had some pretty solid growth in pay. Something that is today's macroeconomic scenario. Does it mean that BNP Paribas 
is revising its appetite for risk and for growth and in which areas. I had the impression that we talked about that to some extent. Business in Center Poland, what was the impact uh, of the increase in bonds portfolio on the capital ratios in Q1 2022 and in Q4 2021? The impact of the negative valuation in Q1 is equal to 1 billion sloty. We have to keep in mind that we have the COVID-19 quick fix adjustment, so we recognize only 60% of this negative valuation in the prudential equity. The next question is from Ipo Pema. What's the cost of the settlement agreements with your clients in CHF? Does the bank plan to propose these type of settlements to more customers? So I'm trying to come back to that slide. There was a slide on that subject. I'm not sure if there's anything else that we could add when we talk about those. Uh, the question vis a vis what's on slide number 18? No, I, I don't think so. The, the, the topic is the following. We are negotiating individually with the customers and depending on the characteristic of the loan, so meaning the year of granting, which means also the fixed rate which has been used, uh, many parameters, so the costs are totally uh, different. So uh, we cannot disclose specific figures in terms of individual negotiation. All the loans are different. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was the final question that had uh, flowed to us, had come in. And so it's now afternoon. And so there's room to ask one more question, if possible. So there are no more questions. So the benefit of coming here then we can give you a coffee, we can talk behind the seasons, and I can respond to any additional questions you hear in the room have. And so I hope that one quarter from today we'll have more people here. It's nice to have a face-to-face -face contact with you. It feels a little bit different. So, so we'd like to thank you very much for your attendance, both remotely and in person. Take care of yourselves. I wish you a lot of good health, and I can't wait to see you when we see you in one quarter from today and many other opportunities. Bye-bye.